Imagine you're dead. Now, what if I told you that in a few hundred years, your bones could tell me what you looked like, where you lived, and what types of food you ate at different stages of your life? I'm Madam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and welcome to the first episode in my YouTube channel. Archaeology is the study of humans in the past through the material things they left behind, and this doesn't just mean artifacts. A lot of archaeologists, myself included, study the remains of the humans themselves. In this episode, I'll show you just how much we can learn about the dead through their bones by looking at one of the most famous and controversial English monarchs, King Richard III. Richard III was born on the 2nd of October 1452 at Fotheringhay Castle in Northamptonshire to Richard III Duke of York and Lady Cecily Neville. The Duke of York was a potential claimant to the English throne and opposed the rule of King Henry VI, who was descended from the Dukes of Lancaster. Richard's childhood was thus marked by a series of civil wars, known as the Wars of the Roses, where these two rival cadet branches, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, fought for the English throne. As the Duke of York's fourth son to survive to adulthood, the other three being Edward, Edmund, and George, Richard was not likely to become King of England at the time of his birth. However, as is often the case, history had a different plan. In December of 1460, at the near age of eight, Richard lost his father and his brother Edmund in the Battle of Wakefield. Richard then fled to the Low Countries, today Belgium and the Netherlands, with his brother George, but managed to return to England the following year after the Yorkist victory at the Battle of Toten and witnessed his eldest brother become Crown King Edward IV. Richard became the Duke of Gloucester, and in 1465, he was sent to study with his cousin, the Earl of Warwick. However, Warwick and George rebelled against the House of York, and Henry VI was restored to the English throne in 1470. Richard fled back to the Low Countries, this time following his brother Edward, but one year later, Edward managed to defeat Warwick at the Battle of Barnet, and the Yorkists successfully defeated the Lancastrians at the Battle of Tewkesbury. The crown was back in the hands of the House of York. On the 9th of April, 1483, Edward IV died and the throne passed over to his 12-year-old son, Edward V. Richard immediately became his protector and no official coronation took place. Richard discredited the legitimacy of his nephews on the grounds that before Edward IV married their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, he had a pre-contract of marriage to Lady Eleanor Talbot. On the 26th of June, Richard assumed the English throne and was crowned 10 days later. Richard's reign was a controversial one. His nephews went missing, and speculations arose that the king had them killed to guarantee his claim to the throne. At present, these claims remain speculations, although the timely disappearance of Richard's nephews is worth noting. Anyways, Richard grew increasingly unpopular, and his reign was threatened by the growing support for Henry Tudor, and on the 22nd of August, 1485, the two claimants met on the battlefield in an event known as the Battle of Bosworth. It was there that Richard III met his death at the hands of his enemies. He was the last English monarch to die in battle, and his death marked the end of Plantagenet rule in England. According to historical records, Richard III's body was taken to Leicester for public display. The body was then laid to rest in the medieval church of the Grey Friars, apparently without an elaborate funeral. However, the friary was dissolved less than a hundred years later, in 1538, by the infamous King Henry VIII, and demolished soon afterwards. Until recently, the remains of King Richard III were believed to be lost. Research on the monarch began in August 2012, when the University of Leicester collaborated with the Richard III Society and Leicester City Council to establish whether any remains of the friary survived, and to see if the skeleton of Richard could be found. But for the Richard III Society, determining whether his mortal remains were at the friary or, based on one 17th century account, dug up following the dissolution of the monasteries and thrown into the river Soar was of utmost importance. Not only did the archaeological team successfully locate the former church underneath a parking lot, but they also found a skeleton buried underneath the former building's choir. On February the 4th, 2013, the University of Leicester announced the remains to be those of King Richard III. But how did they come to that conclusion? The answers lied in his bones. Firstly, radiocarbon dating of the bones suggested that this person died between 1456 and 1530 AD. This is consistent with Richard III's recorded death year of 1485. Just by looking at the bones, researchers could also tell that the person was male and that he died between 30 and 34 years of age. Richard was 32 when he died. 11 perimortem injuries, meaning injuries that took place at or near someone's time of death, 
were also confirmed, and three particular injuries, two to the cranium and one to the pelvis, were classified as fatal. Richard's skeleton lacked battle wounds on his arms and hands, likely because he was heavily armored, and so the injury to the pelvis probably occurred post-mortem or after his death. His likely cause of death then was from the injuries to his skull. He also had severe scoliosis, meaning his spine was irregularly curved, so one of his shoulders sat higher than the other. Interestingly, that Richard had uneven shoulders is documented in historical records. Moving on to DNA analyses, Richard III's Y chromosomal haplogroup was found to be GP287, which is a branch of the haplogroup GM201. What's a Y chromosomal haplogroup? Don't worry, I'll make this quick and easy. Our DNA, which is pretty much a code that contains a bunch of information about us, is packed into small structures we call chromosomes, which humans have 23 pairs of. The last pair is our sex chromosomes, which determine whether you are going to be male or female. The presence of the Y sex chromosome means that you're male. Since the Y chromosome only gets passed down from father to son, your Y chromosomal haplogroup can be used to trace your direct paternal ancestry. Everyone who shares the same haplogroup shares the same direct ancient male ancestor. So, you, your dad, his brothers, your paternal granddad, etc. should all share the same Y chromosomal haplogroup. We can trace direct maternal ancestry by testing another type of DNA known as mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA, which is found in another organelle in our cells called the mitochondrion. Mitochondrial DNA is only passed down from a mother to all her children, regardless of whether that child is a girl or a boy. So everyone can do a DNA test to find out their mitochondrial haplogroup. Surprisingly, none of the living male line relatives that were expected to share a Y chromosomal haplogroup with Richard III were a match. Four of them belong to R1BU152 and one to IM170. However, two genealogically documented direct female descendants of Richard's sister, Anne of York, shared his mitochondrial haplogroup, J1C2C3. This haplogroup is extremely rare in Europe. No matches were found by the researchers in a database of over 26,000 European samples, nor in a database of over 1,800 samples from Britain at the time of the study. So this match is unlikely to have been a mere coincidence. With regards to differences in the Y haplogroups then, it's very likely that a false paternity event took place somewhere in intervening generations. In other words, a lady slept with someone she shouldn't have. Well folks, this stuff happens. DNA was also able to tell us what Richard III probably looked like. There was a 96% chance that he had blue eyes and a 77% chance that he was blonde. Although people with similar hair color probabilities today show that this can range from blonde to light brown, this isn't surprising because genetics give us likelihood of childhood hair color and many people born blonde witness hair darkening as they grow up. There are no known contemporary portraits of Richard III, but an early 16th century one depicts him with blue eyes and light brown hair, just as his genetics predicted. And that's not all we can learn from human bones. We also have stable isotope analysis, which can reveal interesting things about a person's diet and geographical movements. So what's an isotope? Well, all elements on the periodic table are made up of atoms that contain the same number of protons in their nuclei, but the number of neutrons can differ. These variants are called isotopes. So nitrogen atoms always have seven protons, but the two naturally occurring isotopes, 14N and 15N, have seven and eight neutrons respectively. When we eat and drink, isotopes get absorbed into our tissues, including our teeth and bones. As different parts of our skeleton remodel at different rates, or not at all in the case of enamel and dentine, comparing isotopic signatures from different parts of the skeleton can tell us what a person ate and the type of environment he or she experienced at different moments of his or her life. There is way too much information on stable isotope analysis to be laid out in such a short episode, but the important thing to know is that we can study dietary changes and geographical movements through measuring and comparing isotope values in different bones. For Richard III, isotope signatures confirmed his origins in Northamptonshire, but they also showed that he moved to Western Britain by the age of seven or eight. This, not surprisingly, matches historical sources, which record him living at Ludlow Castle in the Welsh Marches in 1459. He then spent the majority of his adulthood back in eastern England. His move out of Northamptonshire was associated with greater consumption of cereals and less meat and fish, and then during the last years of his life, when he was king, he consumed greater amounts of high-status luxury foods, such as wildfowl and freshwater fish, and a lot more wine. Literally, you are what you eat. So, 
Now you know that if archaeologists dug you up in a few hundred or even a thousand years time, they can find out when you died, whether you were female or male, your likely age at death, whether your skeleton experienced any trauma, your haplogroups, what you probably looked like, if you made any dietary changes, whether you moved to another geographical location, and so on. And that's it for this episode. I hope you found the identification and analysis of the mortal remains of King Richard III intriguing, and if you have any questions, either about the English monarch or anything related to archaeological science and ancient DNA, drop a line in the comments below and don't forget to give this video a like. Subscribe for more cool content by your go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.